Good evening, everybody, and welcome to this Imperial Lates event. My name is Shannon, and I'm going to be your host for this evening. I'm a science communications master's student here at Imperial, and I feel really honored and excited to be kicking off this series of Imperial Lates events, where we'll be exploring the link between science fiction and real-world cutting-edge scientific research, a lot of which is done here at our very own Imperial College London. Now, when we think of AI and science fiction, we often think of scenarios where AI is taking over the world and there's war and subjugation. It's all very, very dramatic. But this evening, we're actually going to be focusing on something perhaps slightly more intimate in person, and that's the possibility of real relationships between humans and AI. Now, science fiction often portrays AI as robots with human-like characteristics. Friendships and romantic relationships with robots have been widely described in movies, books, and TV shows. But how exactly do these depictions compare with current scientific research and what might be possible in the future? Now, everybody watching here isn't here to hear me talk for an entire hour. So to help me decipher these questions, I'm joined by three brilliant guests tonight. So firstly, we have Dr. Afric Campbell. Now, Afric is an author and lecturer at Imperial College London, who's recently published The Lovemakers, a speculative fiction novel about human and AI relationships, featuring essays from leading scientists and commentators. Now, Afric, to kick us off, what's your favorite piece of science or speculative fiction? Well, I'm going to go for the novel Speak by Louisa Hall, which was published in 2015. It's a really unusual philosophical novel in five voices that tackles our human-machine relationship. <laughs> five voices, that sounds, that sounds absolutely brilliant. So next, we are super lucky to have Professor Murray Shannon. And now, Murray is a researcher in artificial intelligence at Imperial College London and at Google DeepMind. And he was also the scientific consultant on the British sci-fi film Ex Machina, which was, was brilliant. I loved it. <laughs> so, Murray, same question. What's your favourite piece of science or speculative fiction? Uh, well, I'm not allowed to go for Ex Machina. So I was just going to say, yeah, maybe not Ex Machina. <laughs> um, so I, I think I'm going to go for um, Solaris, actually, by Stanislav nice. Lem. Um, both the novel is wonderful, and there are there are several films, and uh, the Tarkovsky film is 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 incomparable. It's uh, it's really all about a, a very very alien mind indeed, a kind of sentient sea, and that's the kind of topic that really <laughs> fascinates me. Oh, that's amazing. I've written both of those down, actually, in my notebook, so I'll have a look. And finally, uh, rounding off our panel, we have Dr. Anita Chandran. Now, Anita is a researcher and science fiction author. Um, and in 2019, Anita won the Science Challenge, which is the Royal College of Science Union's annual science competition for her short story, Nothing But Art, which is about and a lovely story <laughs> about art and love and relationships with artificial intelligent robots. So, Anita, same question. What's your favourite science fiction story movie book? And you can plug your own, actually, if you want. <laughs> uh, so I'm not going to plug my own, um, though I might plug Ex Machina, which is a fantastic film if you haven't seen it. But I'm going to be really cheeky and I'm going to give you two. So my favourite is a book by author Ursula K. Le Guin called uh, The Left Hand of Darkness. But a book that I really think you ought to read um, about artificial consciousness um, is Ancillary Justice by Anne Leckie, which won the Hugo Prize, but was published in 2013. Really, really interesting take on kind of the idea of hive consciousness and AI human relationships. It's brilliant. It's excellent. I'm actually halfway through Left Hand of Darkness at the moment, and it's, it's taken me a bit of time, but now I'm really enjoying it. So I, I also plug that one. <laughs> so, right, before we kick things off properly, um, obviously I'll be here asking our experts some questions, but I want everybody watching to know that please... Um, send through some questions, your thoughts, your opinions, some ideas. Um, I'll try to get through as many as possible. Um, but if not, if we don't get through all of them, we'll definitely be looking at them. Um, my colleague Mimi is working behind the scenes. So she's going to be uh, sending me through the comments and stuff. So please get in contact with us. We probably won't have a Q&A session at the very end. So we're going to try and do this throughout the, um, throughout the talk. So please just as it comes into your head, put it out there. There's no judgment here. Um, a final thing is uh, we do want to create a nice safe welcoming environment this evening um so please be nice to each other please don't <laughs> do perhaps any hugely controversial um comments um i know you're probably thinking how controversial can science fiction get i was actually in a discussion a few days ago about mary Shelley's frankenstein and if that was considered science fiction or not and it got very very nasty very very quickly so <laughs> we, we definitely don't want to have that um but yeah so um i think so i think we can get going so i'm going to start with you guys some probably some easy starter questions just so we can get to know our panel a little bit better so 
Murray, do you mind getting us going? Could you perhaps give us a few examples of what artificial intelligence or AI is and perhaps a few examples of what it isn't? Mm. Well, starting with what it isn't uh, is is really the kind of science fiction we are, uh, the kind of um, uh, thing we we often see in science fiction films <laughs> and books. So that's the kind of thing that, I, that the public is used to thinking of as, as as AI. But it's it's actually a very long way from the, the sort of thing that we're actually actually building today. Um, so what we often see in a, in, a, in a science fiction film is uh, is a, a, a humanoid robot, and that's that's the sort of exemplary kind of uh, AI that we that we see. Um, and moreover, the the humanoid uh, robot often has a kind of intelligence that's that's uh, somehow equivalent to our own, a sort of human level mm -hmm. intelligence. And uh, and the truth is that most actual AI around at the moment, first of all, it, we, we we're nowhere near being able to to replicate human level intelligence, and the majority of it is not really um, embodied in the sort of humanoid form like that. It's it's uh, the majority of it's not embodied at all. So that so the so the so what I mean by that is that it's so so things like Alexa and, and Siri and so on are sort of disembodied voices, but there's they're artificial intelligence. That's real examples of a of of a, of a kind of artificial intelligence. Also, systems systems like um, AlphaGo. So uh, I worked for DeepMind and famously um, DeepMind built a system that was able to beat the world, the world's you know, leading Go player, this Chinese, very difficult Chinese game of Go. Uh, and that's an AI system. Um, uh, the, a lot of people are working on self-driving cars and, uh, and, and it's an, an AI system is what's making the self-driving cars uh, go. So those are all examples of real world um, uh, AI systems. And that's quite interesting because they're not, so when we're saying real world, it's not even like it's real in there, it's in a lab, it's in people's homes. It's people, we're already interacting it in a day-to-day -day basis. Absolutely, we are. And 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 that's that's going to become increasingly, increasingly the case. Mm -hmm. um, that, that just, you know, ordinary, <laughs> everyday people are going to be interacting with AI more and more. And also as a tool in the in, in industry and in mm -hmm. business and in science itself, it's going to become more and more important. Yeah, definitely. So, and Anita, actually, so your story, um, it, it, it's, could you, could you tell us a little bit more about your short story? Because I know that features um, interactions between humans and AI in that very, yeah, personal in the home sort of level. Yeah, absolutely. So my short story, um, Nothing But Art, is about a painter. And it's told from the point of view of a, I kind of, as Murray exactly said, one, one might not want to write about, but from a humanoid AI. Um, who is kind of contemplating their own relationship with this painter and trying to find a vocabulary to determine their own relationship, which is hard um, because, or it was hard for me as a writer because I had to think a lot about how a robot might think um, or what consciousness really kind of means. But mm -hmm. it, it's a short, short story um, which examines or unspools their relationship over the course of one evening. Yeah. So, and so, Afrik, yours is um, your story also explores these relationships between humans and AI. Could you tell us a little bit about uh, a little bit about your book? Sure. Yeah. Well, um, the book, The Love Makers, which came out in uh, December two thousand uh, December. God, I'm lost track of my time now. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> <laughs> it's recent. Is uh, basically poses the question of what is the future of feeling, um, and specifically, what is the future of what we understand at the moment of uh, human love, attachment and desire. So the book combines my novel with uh, non-fiction essays from STEM contributor academics and commentators to basically ask what's at stake in our human relationships. And, and at the heart of the, the book is my speculative novel, which is a philosophical thriller set in the near future. And that tells a story of a chance encounter between two women. One is an AI developer and the other is a young woman who reveals dark secrets about her robot relationships. And these stories will have devastating consequences for both of their lives. So the themes <laughs> of the novel revolve around the social impact of AI and robotics, um, love and attachment with motherhood, class, work, yeah. representation. So it's a blend of storytelling with science communication to really, from my point of view, to ask... Um, what AI reveals about our humanity. That's, I mean, because I, that, I mean, that sounds brilliant. I know, Efric, you worked quite closely with a lot of um, scientists and uh, science communicators and commentators. Um, were your, was your characters or your stories perhaps influenced by those interactions or perhaps by the, the scientists themselves? 
Well, I have to say, and the book has been a really, really long project for me for you know, for many reasons. So, to and I did work with with a lot of researchers, but later in the process, and the seed for the book for me grew out of the undergraduate studies in um, linguistics in Sweden, where I got interested in natural and, and artificial languages when I was studying formal logic, and I worked on a cross disciplinary project <laughs> at IBM there. Um, and that was where I first saw my first robot, one of those old school industrial robots. Nobody would be very impressed anymore. But it was that um, amazing feeling of being in the presence of something that you knew was going to be very important. Um, but it took years before I could conceive the book. Um, and it really wasn't until I arrived at Imperial, was teaching the advanced creative writing program, that I found the space and was able to essentially pester the scientists in the, in the different fields uh, to be able to have these kind of discussions. So to me, it was very important that the book would be authentic in the sense, extrapolating about the future, but based around not pure fantasy, but what might yeah. actually occur. Um, so that included discussions with uh, various professors of bioengineering, Holger Krapp, um, and his uh, fly lab, uh, Alex Adamo at the London Mathematics Laboratory, who helped me solve some problems about the development of an IP, which is going to feature in uh, in the novel, Roberto Trotta, an astrophysicist also to, at, at Imperial, who contributed to the book. And of course, Anita, conversations with Anita, who was once my student, that's how old oh, I am. <laughs> um, and while she was completing her PhD, of course, she was writing that story. And also discussions in class with students, a lot of the students were computer science students, uh, bioengineering students, who are becoming increasingly interesting in writing about things like consciousness that's appearing in, in, in their stories. And of course, Mary, who I was fortunate to meet, uh, had a really useful conversation at DeepMind um, and uh, an introduction to the Leverhulme Center for Future Intelligence. So all of those, uh, all of those conversations were in a sense um, a question about uh, if you combine storytelling with with real research, what's the effect? It's a bit the effect mm -hmm. like the effect of you know watching a science fiction movie and then figuring, having loads of questions afterwards that you want to ask what's real, what's imagined. <clears throat> Yeah, I know that the BMJ and the British, um, I've definitely been to a movie like that, and then they've had experts bring yeah. it after. So it's kind of, yeah, like that, but in book form. So we do actually have a comment uh, from some of the audience from Will Stolton, who's saying, I always loved the idea of a giant computer in iRobot, the book, basically being a child who needs to be directed and nurtured into thinking more like a human rather than just being a robot. Now, I know, African, your book, you actually, you have a similar relationship between like sort of parent and child, but for you, um, there's you have this concept of iMom, <laughs> Could you tell us maybe a little bit more about that? Sure. I mean, the, the, I, in, in the novel, for me, it was really important to address um, the sort of narrow domain of particular sectors. I've written a book about, about finance and the, um, the effect of representation in male-dominated industries, and so technology was an obvious one. So I was particularly interested in representation. And um, a, an AI developer who also had a broader context, it wasn't just about, who you know, her, had a family. So... so um, She's a high, she's an old school um, in this fictional world and, and ambivalent about technology. So the I Mom, the I Mom um, is a high end humanoid robot that's a proxy for a parent, and it can be customized to look exactly like the mother. Um, you can download her memories, and essentially um, the child can bond with the mother. Uh, in the story, the, the dilemma for her is that everybody around her in a social including her husband in a social context, believes that you should use an iMom um, if you're a mother. And she disagrees. She wants mm -hmm. a child to have the real human experience. Um, and I think that, you know, if I look at the, the, the essay, for example, in the book from Bryson Bugani on robot nannies, these are real issues that we have to confront and discuss. You know, it's, it's, it's obvious that, for example, competitive parenting means that if you have the money, you will buy... Um, yeah. <laughs> such a robot that can educate your child and that creates problems of inequity and um, that sort of thing. Um, but I think that that parent, um, that, that human uh, machine relationship has a particular importance for young children. I mean, we see that in, in real life, their ability to bond with machines and research, which of course is very difficult to do because some children seems to suggest um, that, you know, children, some children will develop a preference for machine relationships. So the question is not whether necessarily that's right or wrong. It's the question, are we having those conversations? Mm -hmm. And I mean, I can open that up to the, the panel as well. So Anita, Murray, would you would you want your kids to have an eye mom? Or <laughs> would you, would you like sure. to speak to that? Again, this is open to the comments as well. Please let me know. <laughs> 
And um, well, I'm, I, it's not specifically about an I mum, but rather this question of training and um, growing. So, as Will kind of said in his in, in their comment, I guess, um, you know, if you think of a robot as a child that needs to be nurtured, I think that was something that I thought was very interesting when I was writing, and I think is an interesting thing about artificial consciousness in general, right? Because the way consciousness develops is you train a thing to get better, right? Whether that's a child or an, an algorithm that you're teaching or feeding a training set, data set to. Um, and I always thought the way humans developed emotional intelligence as beings is not actually by reading about it, but rather by interacting with other humans and using that as their training process. Um, and so I thought that was, that, that that's, I think, the angle I tried to take in my short yeah. story. Um, but also I think a very interesting example when you think about things like robot nannies, because you're looking at something which is kind of growing in response to an external stimulus like a child um, and wondering what, how is the interaction with that child developing that machine consciousness and what way is that unique and spontaneous? I think that's a really interesting question. I'm not sure exactly it answers no, the question no, that I like to have had an eye mum. Um, <laughs> perhaps not um, in case my mum's listening um, <laughs> yeah. I mean so it's interesting now that we've already you've mentioned this this idea of consciousness you've mentioned this idea of emotion emotion intelligence Murray is is that something you can code <laughs> I know coding is very good at doing logical stuff and numbers and maths but can we actually code something like em emotions or, or consciousness well, so can I first of all ask uh, answer the previous question? Of course, um, yeah. <laughs> about the I, the I mama, the I nanny. So my answer will be absolutely not. Uh, I mean, I don't think there's the slightest substitute for um, for human love in um, uh, you know in nurturing and bringing up a, a child. So um, so my answer there is is most definitely no. Um, uh, uh, and. And just, I'm not answering your question quite yet, but it's kind of related. But just on the subject, though, of, um, you know, I was talking earlier, earlier on about how we haven't really got anything quite like human level intelligence in AI yet. That's in, still, still in science fiction. Um, but uh, but I do think that, I, that, that one way to kind of, uh, probably the way to get there uh, is actually via a kind of developmental route that sort of to some extent, you know, reproduces um, what we see in 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 the way children are, are brought up. So mm -hmm. so when we when babies interact with the just the ordinary everyday world, they're learning so much about basic the basic common sense you know ingredients of of our ordinary uh, everyday uh, world. You know just ordinary objects and, and 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 how they fit together and how they interact with each other, uh, other people and other animals and how they behave and how they 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 interact and all of those things you learn by interacting with a with the physical world and its other inhabitants, and um, uh, so so I think the way to kind of get more and you know better and better AI that more closely approximates human level AI is via you know bringing them up a little bit like a ch like a child. I mean, it's a very much an analogy; it wouldn't be exactly like that, but I think it's quite a quite a good one. Uh, uh, as for consciousness, yeah, the C word always comes up <laughs> in kinds of, uh, kinds of discussions, and um, so. Do I think it's possible? You know, this is the thing: is that do I think it's possible to build uh, an artifact that 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 is is conscious? Well, I I I suppose the simple answer is yes. I think it's possible um, to to do that. Um, you know, is it something that we're that's about to happen? I don't think so. I don't think we're on the cusp of doing that at the moment. Uh, and um, if we uh, if we were, I think we should think very hard about whether we sh uh, should uh, do it. That was a Titanic mm -hmm. sneeze from someone. I uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> don't know if that was that was a comment on my uh, on my position, but uh, yeah. So I think we should um, perhaps think twice about whether to do it if that actually does become possible. So, so I think mm -hmm. uh, yeah, possible. Um, I think we're not right there yet, uh, quite there yet. Um, and if we look like we're getting there, maybe we should have a have a, a big conversation about whether it's the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. And uh, African Anita, do you have any any comments on perhaps the ethical considerations of that? I, th I think it is a, a big issue about the behavioural considerations because I mean, this is happening in the here and now. We see the intimate relationship that children and adults are developing with the machines. I mean, we see it in restaurants all the time, entire families sitting there, not talking, but everybody has a device. So for children and particularly for babies, 
in the the early learning period, that's absolutely critical. I mean, we, you know, research shows that eye gaze, for example, for babies is absolutely critical in, in, in understanding uh, human reactions and in communicating with parents. And uh, you know, I don't know if any of you have seen these devices where you you clip onto onto buggies where the phone is facing towards the parent and the baby is lying flapping in uh, in the in buggy trying to desperately attract its parents' attention. Um, if, if that child, if that baby misses out on what we are, how we are nurtured in terms of relating relating to other humans we don't really understand what that effect will be. So I think these, these things are actually in behavioral terms quite urgent, that, that the public understanding, if you're gonna teach mothers about breastfeeding, you should also teach them about the importance of eye gaze. But, you know, that would be yeah. my view. So, um, yeah, no, so we're, again, we're, we're kind of talking around this idea of, of development and learning. And I know that's something that's kind of in the discourse around artificial intelligence as well, Mari, that uh, the idea that, um, an AI can can learn and develop, perhaps to become more more human like. And um, I know there was there was a film in twenty fourteen with uh, called Her, which featured um, Joaquin Phoenix in a better role than in Joker, I personally think, um, and Scarlett Johansson. And it's a lovely little film. And in that film, Scarlett Johansson is plays the disembodied voice of um, an artificial an artificial intelligence of an, an OS. And Joaquin Phoenix eventually falls in love with her, and they have this relationship. But the the AI sort of learns and evolves to become a, a, a better partner for this guy. Do you th is that how this works? <laughs> can an AI eventually learn to if it doesn't if we haven't programmed it with emotion? Can it eventually learn to do that? Or again, is that even beyond stuff we should be even considering right now? Well, I mean, it's such a great question because because um, I, I think the answer is that um, so, so 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 learning is absolutely central to today's artificial intelligence. Um, so it's it's really successful because of progress in so-called machine learning. Um, and so it's completely, you know, core core idea. Now it's not necessarily like human learning. It's okay. a, it's really a very different kind of thing. But um, but but let's set that to one side for the <laughs> for the moment and, and kind of answer your question a bit more more directly so 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 some of today's um uh, uh, ai that's becoming more and more um kind of uh, prevalent uh, is is um the kind of ai that's very good at using language that can that can uh, that can you know engage in a conversation that's quite convincing these days it can um write you know news stories and essays and poems that's re the really that's really quite convincing at all i think that uh, in in the very near future we'll have um uh, ai systems chatbot type systems that that um uh, are get, can get better and better and better at at engaging with users and will uh, and and will get better and better potentially at faking um, having an emotional relationship with, with with the users, but it would be faking because there is no, there is no uh, no AI that we can build today um, uh, has anything remotely like emotion whatsoever. It just this that that is simply isn't anything that we, that we build. But but the but the the reason why so echoing what Afric said, it's it, it really is quite an urgent question because of the fact that we can be convinced that there's something there that has emotion. And indeed, you know, a human could, could you know, you could say they can develop uh, an attachment to, to to some kind of AI system, I mm -hmm. suppose. People develop attach, uh, attachments to their cars and, you know, and all kinds of things. And an AI system is going to be very human-like, potentially, in, 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 in especially in its use of language. Um, but there, is really, there really is no one at the other end, you know, and... Um, <laughs> Uh, so it, it's it's a one-way uh, relationship, um, and and I think it's very important to be aware of that. So we do actually have a, a follow-up question for you, Mari, uh, from a JBM uh, around learning and um, training. So um, on this point, lots of AI is goal-based in order for training to take place. What does this mean for developing an AI that mimics human behavior? And would there have to be a, a right behavior as a goal? Yeah, well, I mean, um, so we can you know, we can build an AI system whose whose uh, goal, as it were, is to is to mimic human 
right. you know, human language use. Uh, and in fact, that's, that's exactly the kind of thing that people have been, been building, uh, very, these sort of very large language models that, uh, that, that ingest a, 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 you know, a staggering amount of human language from the internet and from human language corpuses and, um, uh, and, and basically learn to, to, to imitate the way humans use language. So it's, in a sense, it's kind of a goal. It just, the goal is just, you know, do what humans do with language but when you uh when you uh, set one of these things going it's it feels very much like you're interacting with something that is you know that is <laughs> there that there's another being there that you're interacting mm -hmm. with another human but of course you're not so i mean that actually can lead us quite nicely to you anita so i know your um your your story um, focuses a lot on this idea of creativity. So do you think perhaps creativity could be one of these, these goals, something that we, we train an AI or a, a machine to learn to do to, to achieve this idea of creativity? Or for you, is it perhaps something more human than that? So it's a really interesting question. Sorry, I'm still kind of chewing over what Mari said, which is yeah. really interesting too. But, um, but I think in terms, and I think it's actually a pretty similar answer, right? So what I would say is what, is i know this is going to sound deeply pretentious but what is creativity so when we say someone is originally creating we suggest that someone is you know going into their brain and coming up with something new but in reality that's not really how art functions in any meaningful sense the way art functions is in proximity to other art so we imitate artists that we admire we create based on stories that we know are successful and those stories have spun out through the canon of the ages so i think it's almost a bit of an unfair bar that's placed placed right. on artificial intelligences to create something novel um because i don't really think that it's true to say that all artists do push the envelope every time they create art um but in that sense i think you know you can i i think i mean i think it will be possible to in perhaps a more manageable way than say to mimic emotion to enable um, a machine consciousness or a, mach or, or a robot to create something beautiful or that raises emotions in the audience. And this is what I kind of wanted to follow on from Murray about, which is that when you talk about, well, one talks about an, an, a consciousness, a machine consciousness having emotions, it's, I think it's very difficult to separate that from what emotions we project onto those machine consciousnesses. So, you know, if I am a very lonely person and I have an app on my phone that talks to me and it knows me very well, it knows my likes and dislikes, it knows what I want to buy when I want to buy it. It gives me um, Spotify recommendations for songs, which I listen to over and over again, etc. Is that any less valuable to me who is lonely than a real person? especially if that human connection isn't there. And that's a question I don't really have an answer to because, <laughs> it, it, you know, intuitively, I would say, no, obviously, real human friendship is better, but we don't live in a world where that's accessible to everybody. And we don't live in a world where people are empowered to go outside and meet people anymore. Everything is done by app. Um, and I think that can be a very isolated. I think that's a space that technology can actually really help a lot of people in. Um, Mari and Afrik, do you have? Oh, sorry, <laughs> cutting you off there. Uh, Mari and Afrik, do you have any um, other comments yourself about this idea of creativity and perhaps the importance of creativity in in forming relationships? I, th I think that the, the word that um, or the term rather that Murray used really early on in this conversation about embodiment, the importance of embodiment, is really central. Um, the, the reason why her the movie was so powerful is that because a person fell in love with a machine and you know we could see and we see in real life that humans are forming attachments to machines um that do not look humanoid at all and i think that, you know, that gives us lots of evidence that we know people get attached to their smartphones and to as, as anita was talking about to various chatbots um the problem is i think public engagement in the idea of deception um, and transparency around these issues because once you start to bond with something which let's face it we do you know people lose their smartphones and and fall into psychological downdrafts and get really anxious but once we start creating um a, a, a um conversation that appears to be reciprocal that's a deception 
but humans are doing that. And I think Anita's point is very valid that, you know, if you, for, for some for some people, um, robots, it's really well-designed robots, will um, become important therapeutic bots. People are using them and will continue to use them. I suppose the question we'd ask then is, what happens when that attention is taken away mm -hmm. and diverted, when your attention is diverted <laughs> towards a device and you're leaving less space for the human? Th these are you know, ethical, behavioral, enormous challenges. Mm -hmm. Definitely. And, and Murray, yeah, anything to add to that? I know you had something to say about the creativity. Well, about the creativity, but uh, but uh, this, but uh, maybe just very quick comment on, on, on this. Is so, so although I've been a bit kind of, you know, I've been, been a little bit down on the technology in, in my answers on the technology that I myself am work, working on, uh, which, you know, that that's, I think, is a reflection of our tendency to rather, you know, over uh, anthropomorphize it and um uh, and 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 i think that is a mistake but it doesn't mean of course that it isn't an amazing totally amazing technology and that and that people you know it can enrich people's lives um uh, hugely and you know and and cause trouble as well there's no doubt about that um so so just 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 to be uh, clear clear about that but on creativity um uh, uh, so, so I, so one great example. Uh, so Anita gave a, a, a great, you know, uh, um, a re reply thinking about art. But another kind of example of, of, of creativity that I think is very impressive uh, that, that AI has produced is, is with AlphaGo. That I mentioned mentioned earlier on, AlphaGo that defeated Lisa Doll as you know the world's leading Go player at the t at the time, um, and uh, and and during the match. Um, uh, AlphaGo managed to produce a particular move, move 37. It's famous. Everybody knows the number in the, in the field of AI now. This famous move 37, um, which was a move that, uh, as, as was a common at the time, no human would, would, would ever make. And yet it was the move that um, uh, that led to the to the defeat of, of of Lisa Doll in one of these these matches. And the Go commentators, you know, considered this to be an, an extremely creative move, the kind of move that had never really been seen in the in the game before in history, and uh, led to a whole kind of you know new way of thinking about how a particular strategy might 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 be carried out within the game of Go. And that is a you know in a sense a, a genuine example of cre of proper creativity coming from uh, uh from mm -hmm. a machine and i think that's really quite striking no that's <laughs> yeah no and i like that idea of it's a, a different i a different concept of creativity isn't just you know doing painting or, or writing something amazing it's this this idea of creative thinking and well, i'm guessing almost like problem solving uh, which is is really cool so we actually just had a question come through from max davies um and i'm actually going to kind of direct this towards you anita although please uh, either of you um african mari please jump in um, because of current gender imbalance in computer science at the moment will the code training and therefore mannerisms of a bot be inherently male resulting in inadvertent inequalities for ai now Mari, I'm sure, I'm sure all, you, all of you have some answers to this, but I know Anita, your um, your story, um, your your AI character is is purposefully um, gender ambiguous. Uh, gender ambiguous. So um, I wonder if you have any yeah comment on on this idea of the gendering of AI. Um, yeah, actually, in interestingly, the essay also that I wrote for the Love Makers also talks quite a lot and quite heavily about the importance of di diversity in research for. Uh, in, in when it comes to the development of artificial intelligence. So I think the for the for context for anyone who might not know, um, there is a problem um, when we look at optimizing machine learning algorithms, which is when you feed an algorithm a bad set of training data or a biased set of training data, you also can bias the outcomes of that study of that training. Um, so, you know, there are many cases where in research you would give a sample that is say racially biased or is biased towards one gender etc and that can really affect the outcomes of your study both in machine learning and outside um and i think this is becoming increasingly evident in technology in many ways so a really simple example is voice recognition software doesn't for example traditionally recognize or it's getting better now but hasn't always recognized pidgin english so a lot of pidgin english speakers are locked out of being able to use that technology and are kind of in locked out of their technological future in that sense so it is really really important to um sort of be mindful of diversity um on every every level when we're talking about um 
any sort of research, but especially I think AI, which is such, um, is going to become so in instrumental in so many of our lives. Um, as for my short story, um, yes, I wrote the main character, um, uh, Kenny, the AI, is deliberately never gendered. Um, and this was a choice, partly because I was interested as a writer to see what readers, how readers would gender Kenny, but also because I didn't really understand personally what it meant for a robot to have a gender when gender is something to me that is self-determined. So it's something that I myself give um, to me um, and is not given to me in a sense. Um, and for I, I really was interested thinking about how Kenny would present themselves and what would be important for them and how they would even view you know concepts like race and gender which are human concepts and not necessarily machine ones um which i think is generally a very rich vein of kind of philosophical thinking um and that's kind of where i was going that's why i uh chose to do that i made that choice and do you think perhaps uh short stories and fiction like this is a good way to explore that i guess that opens up to you as well afric do you think this is a good way to explore these these very huge philosophical questions in a in a beautiful piece of writing i think it's it's um, imperative i mean partly because in, in at least in the research that i did while writing the book is that um it can be difficult to get women to engage in in ai robotics because it's perceived as being too too male um, and a lot of that has to do with the the images that we see um which is uh, for that um on that point i would reference the better images of ai project Actually are now starting to get um, more sensible images but I think that you know the, rep the, the numbers are low the numbers are going into engineering are, are low um, for women um, and diversity remains a problem in not just technology but in any narrow dom domains where we keep recruiting the same kind of people to do the same kind of work design is a specific problem design engineering um, in uh, in all the uh, AI and robotic product products that, that we see um, and, I, you know, I think there's a huge public engagement ex exercise to to be done here. It's really difficult to, I mean, I spent years working on a book. Um, I, you know, it's really difficult to learn enough to understand what the underlying problems are and to get people who are informed and who are expert, like we have today, uh, um, to talk about these things and to be able to explain them in accessible language. I, it's that's a that's a really big challenge and really urgent. It's not something that we can put on the on mm -hmm. the back burner. <laughs> and I, think, I totally I think agree. Oh no, Sorry, I was just going to say, I totally agree. <laughs> yeah, but uh, just as uh, this is very quick, but also you know I think there is a point which is what well, two quick ones. One is that I think fiction is a way in which society looks forward. So. Re research always also mix can mirror fiction so i'm thinking of like ray bradbury fahrenheit 451 or even irobot you know that's what that's the image that gets lodged in human consciousness and then we try mm -hmm. and create that image so if we're not pushing those ideas of diversity race we're not really speculating on what the future could be we really narrow our scope of what's possible i think and so i think art fiction they have an instrumental role to play in asking and answering those questions I think for me as well, I actually want to come back to you, Afric. Um, when when reading your book and when reading parts of it, the the, the whole idea of I mums really stood out stood out to me because I think we associate motherhood with uh, this I this idea of nature, this idea of organic. You've got Mother Earth, you've got Gaia. Whereas, and you're placing it in this idea of the technology industry, which coming working in there myself, I think is considered to be very encoded to be very very masculine. Do you have any, uh, was was this on, on purpose or did you want to explore this idea of gender in? in it was very much on purpose, but that was to do with, you know, my career. I spent years in, in um, investment banking in a very male dominated world, which I loved. Um, but the thinking was very definitely very defined. It was this white male thinking. Um, and you uh, always had to work harder if you were a woman, you wanted to succeed. And I, I got to a really high level, but the, the point was, um, that shouldn't it shouldn't have had to be that way and i think that the you know in conversations and in discussions in work discussions these kind of issues come up very much now on the one hand you may say women need to engage more and i agree that they do need to engage more um but i think that the the 
whole issue in terms of AI, beca AI becomes really difficult. People will tune out en masse if things are too complicated. And it really, it's how do you get, so, I mean, there are more, just far more discussions now on ethical issues um, and ethical challenges in the domain of AI, um, but not nearly enough in terms of, people have to go looking for them. And I think that that's, that, that's essential in, in education. Education is going to be transformed and relationships are developing all the time. So this is, I remember Anders Sandberg from Oxford coming to Imperial and saying there should be loud conversations and cafes and bars about this. This is fundamental to, to our uh, human experience. <laughs> Well, I know I've definitely had some loud, loudish, probably too loud conversations about some of this with some of my friends, but I think I probably cared about it more than they did. So that was, um, so we actually do have some uh, questions coming through um, from, from the audience. So uh, Anita, a question for you. So taking on uh, from S. Bashuran, taking Anita's point on AI attachments, is there not a danger of devices being hacked and programmed to suggest ideas which may cause harm? I think that is probably something that we all need to be mindful of in general. Um, so who we allow to access what area of our codes. There's obviously it's quite difficult because you're quite a big advocate for codes being published publicly. So then everyone has access to them. Um, you know, I, I think, you know, security is a question that I think will become basically instrumental. I think, for example, data security will become one of the most important questions that we face in this as a society in the next 10 to 20 years. Um, but I, I feel like potential, I, I don't know that it's necessarily the case that you would hack an, a device to create, to impart an idea that would create harm, but rather to survey someone or mm -hmm. um, perhaps do them some sort of malicious intent a different way, though I, it's, it's not a question that really falls within my remit of expertise. So I'd probably so, pass on to someone like Maureen to answer that. So I actually worked in the cybersecurity industry before I did my master's degree here. So this is slightly actually, <laughs> didn't expect this, but well, uh, for me, you. this, <laughs> but for me, this is um, this this issue of oh, should we do it because you know there's a potential danger of it being hacked? That isn't a, f a question for the future. That's a question of something that's already happening now. And cybersecurity is already a huge issue and it's only ever going to get more of an issue. But it's something that we have to do. In we, we have to keep on, in my opinion, we have to keep on progressing in spite of that. Otherwise, if we're just so risk averse, I think there are, I don't think it's enough of a reason to not, to not explore this because um, it's, and I, I'm not sure if you guys have any. Um, well, I mean, the, the only comment I can make, I, I think, on this is that I, I certainly think it's possible. Um, and, and, and as you were saying, Shannon, it's more than possible. It's, it's, it's you know, these are problems that we have uh, have today. You can, and so, so especially, I, I think, if you imagine uh, AI that's interacting with children or vulnerable people, then, then, then it's an, an especially tricky area where you can imagine all kinds of malicious, um, uh, uh, you know, misuses of, of, of the technology. So, yeah, it's absolutely, uh, you know, it, it's certainly an important thing. Um, uh, yes, I mean, do I think we should uh, we should stop all AI development as a consequence? <laughs> no, no, I agree with you on that one as well. Yeah, Michelle. just everyone update their OS, have a good password, you'll be fine. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we actually have a follow-up there. So, um, uh, B. Bash um, S. Bashir is suggesting, should there be a set of AI development rules to ensure diversity and gender inclusion? And I'm wondering, is there already something like that? Or is this something that's in development? Sorry, I said that very fast. You should see it now on the bottom of your screens. I'm not aware. Maria, are you aware of it, or, or Anita? No, I don't there, think so. Rules. I mean, there's lots of I discussion about it. Not rules, but I mean... institution. Sorry, no, I was just making say that I'm sure some institutions do have some sort of formalized, at least hiring system now, but it's certainly not done as a blanket measure, as, as far as... I mean, all, all I can say is to, is to echo, you know, what... Um, uh, uh, African and Nita have already said that, which is that we have a very serious problem with, you know, the lack of gender diversity in our, in, in in the tech industry, and it's and it's something that people are talk talk about all the time, and there is a there's a tremendous will to try and fix this problem, but I, but it but it's also 
somehow seems to be deeply intractable. I remember when I was doing my undergraduate uh, degree at Imperial College in computer science, then the percentage of women on the course was something like it was below 20 percent. And it's not much different now despite an enormous amount of effort to try to attract more women into, into tech. Uh, so it's, it's um, you know, I don't know what the answer is, but I really don't like it. I don't like working in an industry that is so male dom dominated at all. And sort of, yeah, kind of uh, sort of mirroring this, this, this note, uh, we've got a question from Patrick Wilson saying, so um, do we think, most um do we think most sci-fi and fiction um, sorry i oh, can't talk so is most sci-fi too dystopian just too dystopian because it's too dramatic and dark and i'm guessing is it perhaps reflecting <laughs> this this reality we found ourselves in anyway so of course it's going to be dark well i could, can i comment on that very quickly so i so i think one thing about science fiction that we that we we shouldn't lose sight of is that um is that one of its you know one of its one of the primary motives for writing it or making films is to entertain people mm -hmm. and it's not necessarily to to educate people or to reflect <laughs> reality or you know sometimes it is and you know and sometimes it does that and sometimes it provokes deep philosophical thoughts but often you know its primary purpose is to en is to entertain people and the kinds of stories that make great entertainment are ones where things go horribly wrong so i think it's just it's inevitable that we get that we're going to see a lot of dystopian uh, science science fiction mm -hmm. but we shouldn't take it as you know as 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 representative of, of reality it's a, it's a uh, you know, it's an entertainment genre with a with a with a when it, at its best uh, with a philosophical edge you know mm -hmm. uh, that's when i really like it best is when it, it provokes deep philosophical thinking as well definitely um and so i i guess Murray and you guys as well so you, you've already said that what ai isn't is often what science fiction portrays AI to be. Does, does that matter? <laughs> if, if the whole purpose is, is to have fun and to perhaps encourage you to think in ways perhaps that you wouldn't have done before, does it even matter that our media, our literature is maybe giving a bit of a, a different stance on AI, a different idea? Um, I, I would say on that, I completely agree with, with Murray, but I think that you know humans, we like looking at the dark side. We like a good scare. Um, <laughs> That's, you know, that's across all literature. Um, and also it's important that we see the downsides in things. I think the interesting thing that's happened over the last few years, particularly with TV and, and film, is a much more um, sophisticated and, and deeper probing of the human machine relationship, as opposed to so much focus on the technology and, you know, the, the amazing robots. And movies like her, um, the series Humans, um, yes. And the recent German film *I'm Your Man* are really interesting on probing the ethical, behavioural challenges with very sophisticated commentary on that. I think that's really useful because viewers start to focus on the relationship rather than the technology, um, mm -hmm. and that is, you know, leads us back to the point that look, this is a political issue in, in a sense. We get to choose. Um, as long as we focus on it, what the technologies are. I mean, obviously the producers or the manufacturers of technologies um, or who envision, envision design technologies are, are um, it's manufactured by corporate entities. But if we're passive consumers, we don't get rewarded for um, being incurious. And I think that there's an issue of, sort of inertia uh, because of the complexity, complexity around AI where people tune out and therefore we'll just buy a product and leave Alexa sitting in the room so the kids can do what they like. Um, frankly, that's not on. It's a question of you know, responsibility. We, we, we get the chance, for the moment at least, to create the kind of world vision that we want. Um, so if we just sleepwalk towards it, I don't think that the mm -hmm. outcomes will be so great. And, and, and Anita, for you, um, did you did you find a similar thing, or for you was the um, was was your AI inspired by anything probably directly related to science, or did you take quite a lot of creative liberty there? Um, so uh, actually, I, I very much viewed that piece as so. I have a slightly yes and no answer to the initial yeah, question, brilliant. which is like whether or not um, whether or not we should kind of strive for that verisimilitude or similarity, but in my that short story no it was very much a thought experiment it was not, not really anything to do with whether or not that kind of robot could exist but rather about how how a person might develop an, an emotional intelligence in the context of other people um 
and it was about finding language to describe things that you can't you you don't have the words for yourself um and for me that process was important it, it was important to have something that was very devoid and very separate from reality in a way because as kind of Marianne Afric said I wanted the reader to have to think about that question very specifically um and about the philosophical parts of consciousness which scientists you know I'm guilty of it too which we don't really think about so much in our day-to-day -day research we're not asking ourselves well some some of the good ones among us are but you know many of us are very determined to kind of like produce something scientific and we're not thinking always about those moral questions the should we's rather than the do we's um and so that's what I think is important about creative fiction and sometimes means that we take a step back from what's real but then I think Africa has a real point which is that often fiction can influence what we buy what can influence companies in terms of what they make um and so we do have to be active in pursuing a future that we actually want be that in art and fiction or in twitter how we choose to shop how we feed back to companies i think it is very important that we take that active role now and I think that brilliantly. So we're, um, we're coming to about 50 minutes now. And I've got one last question, um, which I'll, I'm an open to all three of you, but also to everyone in the comments and everyone watching as well. What is the potential of AI as a tool for us to understand our own humanity? So what can we learn from making AI, from developing AI, from thinking about AI? What is this as, what, what's the potential here? Well, shall I start with that one? <laughs> <laughs> Go for it. Big um, question. Sorry. A, a very good question. Yes, yes. And I think there could be lots and lots of different answers of different different sorts. So I'm, I'm just going to pursue one angle uh, on, on on that, which is I think that um, uh, I think that we 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 can learn a great deal about um, about the nature of human cognition, about the way the human mind is 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 sort of uh, uh, you know put together and the way and the way it works, and uh, you know in and um, artificial intelligence used to be thought of as just as much you know a, a branch of cognitive science one of the cognitive sciences alongside you know alongside um uh, you know other branches like psychology and neuroscience and philosophy of mind and, and it, it used to be thought of as one way of of studying the mind and um and now nowadays we often think of it more in terms of building things that that, 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 ha that have uses but um but uh, but it certainly used to be thought of as as as, as one way of, of of studying the mind by building models of of, of of the mind and i think we have learned a lot about uh, in in some ways we've learned a lot about how how difficult it is to replicate the human mind in a in, in a machine and we've learned uh, a lot about how not to do it so so for me i i i, I had taken it as a, a, by about the sort of early 90s i'd taken it as a as a as a, a done deal that we shouldn't try and build ai that is disembodied that embodiment is absolutely critical to the very nature of cognition uh, and, mm -hmm. and intelligence um and I, I you know that seemed to be like one of the lessons to take away from from the field up to that point um and because people have very much tried building you know kind of disembodied things now it, it now today all of that's been thrown up in the air somewhat because <laughs> these, all these large language models that i was talking about uh, earlier on are disembodied uh, artifacts and yet they uh, they are you know extraordinary and show you know, extraordinary capabilities so um so you know it's a it's a it's a journey but i think it, it i think ai can shed light on on the nature of, of human cognition which is pretty interesting Amazing. That that's super exciting, actually. <laughs> and and Africa and Anita, any any anything to add to that? I suppose the first thing I'd say is um, probably that we should think more about human history in regards to intelligent machines. There's a very deep history of the human desire to create intelligent machines that goes right back three thousand years. And I think often in the context of our civilization, um, that's the key to, to building public engagement and understanding that this is part of what humans always wanted to do, to be faster and stronger. Um, but now, because we can build these technologies, we need to take more responsibility and we need to look at regulatory issues and we need to monitor 
big tech. Though perhaps that's a way in to interest people. I'm always really surprised if I go into a student group or also in, in other contexts that people think that, you know, AI started in 1956 in Dartmouth and it's just so far away from that. It's, you know, you, you read Ovid's um, Metamorphosis, which is one of the inspirations for my book. So I think that that's one thing. We need to set it in the context of broad human civilization. Um, and the other is that we need to become better storytellers um, and communicators across arts and science, because as, as Mary and Anita pointed out, you know, already we can see um, artificial languages producing really interesting poetry, which is going to actually shake the poets up and the rest of the writers. <laughs> These are really exciting. Um, it, it, an exciting development in languages to be celebrated, and what it means about who we are is incredibly important. So it, it, these emergent technologies reveal something about what we want as humans that is not going to go away, and we can only get better at understanding that. Yeah, I really I, echo I, that um, for on Africa's part. That I think we strive for kind of demystifying what AI is either by becoming better storytellers, by encouraging interdisciplinarity. You know, I, I trained as a physicist. It was very uncommon um, even now, um, especially now, I suppose, for people to do both, to try to do both. It's really unusual. Um, but I think we need more of that. people who are um, willing to not just understand the technology, but understand the philosophy too. Um, and really be willing and capable of sharing those with the public in a way that's interesting. Excellent. Thank you so, so much, Anita. Um, I think I think we're going to have to, um, I'm going to have to take us home now. <laughs> We've only got five minutes left. Thank you so much, guys. I think that was a really, really good discussion. I had a great time. I hope you guys did. Um, uh, we do have a question for you, Efric. Um, is, is your book coming out in paperback? Well, give me a chance. It only came out in December. <laughs> <laughs> No, it will, but I, I don't have a date yet. But th there is a, um, a Kindle, you know, an e-version. E, uh, e Brilliant. Excellent. So watch this space. Um, well, thank you guys so much for being here this evening. Um, thank you, everybody who's watching us. Um, I hope you've, you've had a great time. Thank you so much for your questions and your comments. Um, they were super interesting. And I think they, they really... Uh, gave this discussion something extra as well. Um, of course, this is only one event for the Imperial Lates event around science fiction. Uh, we're also in person on campus, which is amazing. On Thursday, I'll be there with iScience Magazine. Um, there'll be some pa more panel talks. There'll be people sharing their research. It's gonna be an amazing evening. I'd hope to see, hopefully some of you guys listening in, in there. And thank you so much. Um, have a good evening. <laughs> thank you, Shannon. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for your moderation. It was really great. No, and thank you, Mimi, as well. She's behind the scenes. She's been doing a great job this yes. evening as well. So. <laughs>